Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. How are you, Fee? I'm doing okay, Michael. Keeping on, keeping on. In this sort of strange, I don't know, what stage of um, easing of lockdown or not where we're at, really. It's funny at the minute, isn't it? I'm not sure what we're in. Mm. We can't really call it lockdown anymore, can we? No. I don't know what it is. No, but I do feel still locked down, really. Well, you know, my my industry, the theatres especially, you know, uh, absolutely still a very long way from opening up again. Um, so, yeah, that feels very much still in lockdown. And other things are kind of seemingly sort of coming back. You know, we can go to pubs and restaurants again now in particular ways. So, yeah, it's a strange limbo-ish feel to things for me at the minute. I think I find it most peculiar where you kind of enter an environment and there's a sort of semblance of it sort of trying to go back to what it was, but you know that it isn't, so it can't Mm. be. It just doesn't, I don't know, it's like it all needs to be very different or something. We have both had our hair cut. That is a relief, Michael. I mean, thankfully our listeners don't have to put up with looking at us but you know (laughs) it's a weight off my mind (laughs) quite literally very good now um the the sharper eyed amongst our listeners fiona will have noticed that we have a new logo and this is the beginning of a sort of phased launch of some new kind of uh yeah like a visual identity and some some design stuff and We've had some expert assistance from the wonderful people at Doozy Studio. Uh, Ella Donald and Charlotte Carnegie-Brown have been holding our hand and guiding us through this process and coming up with these incredible designs and visuals for us. And so just want to give a big shout out to them and a massive thank you for all of their work. They really have gone above and beyond to help us get to this point. And to celebrate... Uh, this fact, we are in fact going to have a competition this month, Fee, and we're going to give away a print that the Doozy uh, Studio have created as part of uh, another project that they have that's called the Dolly Effect that celebrates female artists of all kinds. Uh, But they've produced a print, a limited edition print, and we've kept one back as a prize. And we're just asking listeners to let us know what their favourite episode of the Poetry Exchange has been and why. Uh, So just a very simple thing, and we're going to pick the winner out of a hat, and we're going to send them this print. Now, the print was inspired by the Carol Ann Duffy poem Prayer and the conversation that we had, and it was it's one of my favourite episodes still. Just an extraordinary story that goes with that episode. Find that one and have a listen if you haven't. So there's this beautiful print that's been created, inspired by the poem, and we're going to give that away as our competition prize. So this is a really lovely thing, Michael, that we've got this uh, chance to offer people the chance to win a limited edition print. It's a fabulous piece of work. It was one in a series that their project commissioned from artists as a way of uh, supporting visual artists during lockdown, and they very kindly gave one to us. So we're now giving it away to whoever of you is able to, in a way, send us a bit of feedback. What's been your favourite episode so far and why? And if you just drop us a note, it's probably easiest to do that by email, hello at thepoetryexchange.co.uk. We will um, pull a winner out of the hat and get this fabulous piece of artwork to you. Fee, we have got quite a special episode this month. Do you want to tell us about it? It is indeed a special episode, Michael. Last year, so before COVID-19 was the dominant theme in our lives and before lockdown and all those things, we had the great pleasure of going and spending some time with the fabulous award-winning playwright and screenwriter Stephen Beresford. I'm sure Many of our listeners will be fans of his work. First play, The Last of the Housemans, 
BAFTA award for Pride, of course, the film. And also, not so long ago, I think, um, Fanny and Alexander at the Old Vic and many other works besides. All round amazing writer, brain, such a privilege to spend time in his company. And it is a real honour for us to be able to bring this conversation to you. Yeah, I was having a listen back earlier and I was just reminded how much uh, how much fun we had. You know, uh, we had a lot of laughs. So uh, I really hope you enjoy it. You're going to be listening to myself and Fiona talking about Ver de Societe by Philip Larkin, the poem that's been a friend to Stephen. Now I can see in front of us mm-hmm. there is a poem by Philip Larkin. Yeah. Mm. Would you mind reading it for us, Sure. Please? My wife and I have asked a crowd of craps to come and waste their time and ours. Perhaps you'd care to join us in a pig's arse, friend. Day comes to an end. The gas fire breathes. The trees are darkly swayed. And so, dear Warlock Williams, I'm afraid. Funny how hard it is to be alone. I could spend half my evenings if I wanted holding a glass of washing sherry, canted over to catch the drivel of some bitch who's read nothing but witch. Just think of all the spare time that has flown straight into nothingness by being filled with forks and faces rather than repaid under a lamp, hearing the noise of wind and looking out to see the moon thinned to an air-sharpened blade. A life, and yet how sternly it's instilled. All solitude is selfish. No one now believes the hermit with his gown and dish, talking to God, who's gone too. The big wish is to have people nice to you, which means doing it back somehow. Virtue is social. Are then these routines, playing at goodness, like going to church, something that bores us, something we don't do well, asking that ass about his fool research, but try to feel because, however crudely, it shows us what should be. Too subtle that, too decent too. Oh hell, only the young can be alone freely. The time is shorter now for company, and sitting by a lamp more often brings not peace, but other things. Beyond the light stand failure and remorse, whispering, Dear Warlock Williams, why, of course. Brilliant. I mean, the, my problem with this is that I have so many mm. friends, really. I mean, like, that was... So I was really careful about following your brief. Mm. And of friends that I have as poems, there's probably ten. So I chose this one because I think it's the one that currently I feel most close to. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliantly done. So, Brilliantly okay, processed. Great. I love that. Good, Brought glad. my current current best friend. Fra- best yeah. friend. It really is quite literally this. It is the friend that most other people don't like and they say the wrong thing and people there's also there's a WhatsApp group where people discuss how terrible they are. And so for me I was like because of their unpopularity, because they're difficult, I find I have and as I've got older, I more and more grow to respect them. The tone is so very clever and particular yeah. and brilliantly achieved. Yeah. He, yeah, he's very clever at, because I think everybody understands that feeling of I don't want to go to a party. There are two massive things that if you want to be a human being alive in the world, you have to negotiate. And they are being alone and being with other people. <laughs> That's it. You've got to work <laughs> out how you're going to do those two <laughs> things. It should be on this curriculum. That <laughs> might be one of the most profound things I've ever heard. <laughs> distilled. Well, oh, thank you. I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> but, but, it, but although everybody knows that feeling of I don't want to go to your karaoke party, I don't want to go to your hen weekend in Cyprus. But what's brilliant is he, he takes you to the deep heart of why and what it means. And he's too clever a poet to just say, I don't like people even though that is part of what he's saying. And I suppose the reason why for me it's a great friend as a poem is because I'm a writer, and any artist really, but writers particularly mm. have to understand that you aren't going to, and it's not just, it's not just solitude. 
it's also you need to be lonely. It has to be a little bit a little bit uncomfortable mm. before you actually can do it, I think. I've realised. Mm. That's why all that mm. stuff about the moon and the lamp. The moon and the lamp is brilliant. Yeah. And the trees darkly swayed. Mm. And out there, out of that window, those are the trees darkly swayed. I mean, I look at them and I, and, you know, and I work at night quite often as well. Mm. So it really, that really resonates. Mm. There's a bit where he's, um, he almost loses me when he says, uh, I could spend half my evenings if I wanted holding a glass of washing sherry. That's good. That's a great line. Mm. Canted over to catch the drivel of some bitch who's read nothing but which. And it's the, it's the librarian in him and it's the sort of, you know what I mean? It's the university snob that says, yes. people who haven't, who've only read which can be, in fact, which is a consumer magazine, am I right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, I mean, if you're buying a washing machine, yeah. the only person in the party worth talking to is the person who only <laughs> reads Wick. Yes. So I don't, I, that's where me and Philip part company slightly. Yeah. yeah. Because I think he feels people who haven't read are not interesting, which of course is nonsense. It's not great for women though, either, is it? No, he does say bitch as well. Yeah, he does. And, and the drivel of some bitch. Yeah, yeah. You it's kind the, of sense the misogyny there. It's a, it's a controversial line. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll just move on from that yeah. <laughs> into the good stuff, well, of which there is plenty. Before, before I, mm. it gets too late to ask, what does the title mean? It's a kind of conven a poetic convention which the French got, were into in like in the 18th century. So it's sort of ancien regime. It was a thing at court. So it, it, means, it means a poem for, um, for a small group of friends. So it would mean something that, for example, I would write for us three oh, and I'd read it at a salon and then we'd all roar with laughter at how witty I'd been about the Cardinal. <laughs> that's, that's the sort of thing. So he's being very... We just did. Yeah, and you did, which was sweet We of played me. our part. You did wonderfully. So he's being satirical about his snobbery, which is there for sure. How did it come to you, this poem? I think I started to get interested in Larkin. I, didn't, I found him a bit depressing uh, when I was young, because he, he is a bit... I mean, I oh know that's not true. I don't think he's at all depressing. But when you're young, you don't really understand that stuff about life and death and how short life is. And, um, on TV, Alan Bennett, so this would be late 80s, early 90s, when I'm at uh, sick form, Alan Bennett did a series of lectures about, on different poets. And one of them was Philip Larkin. And I liked Alan Bennett, so I watched them. And he really helped me to get it. And what I'd, what I'd been missing before was that... Um, he was funny. I thought, oh, I see, that's all funny. I didn't get that you were allowed yeah. to laugh at that. Yeah. I just thought you were supposed to go, oh, isn't it awful being, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, isn't being it? in Hull in the 60s? <laughs> I didn't realise poetry was allowed to be funny. Yeah, oh. it takes a while to a get that. Big revelation oh. to yeah. me. <laughs> unless, it's like unless it's bangingly obvious. Yeah. It's hard to yeah. get that, that, that you go, oh, there's an irony. And Bennett tells a story in this lecture where he says, it's some apocryphal story about Larkin standing at the bus stop outside the university in Hull. It's pouring with rain and he has an umbrella and a fellow academic, another, someone, another member of the faculty is standing at the bus, bus stop, you know, getting drenched and starts to edge towards Larkin until as he's almost underneath the fronds of the umbrella, Larkin says, don't think you're getting under my umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> and the man sort of meekly steps back. <laughs> And, there's, and as Alan Bennett says, there's something about Larkin's poetry that is that. Mm. Don't think you're getting under my umbrella. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, this is the experience of being alive and you'd better face it. And I sort of thought, I like that. Mm. I like that. It's unsentimental. I'm not going to make it cosy and comfortable no for No way. Because mm. it isn't. Mm. It's kind of the um, most incredible lens, isn't it, that mm. comes on everything. There's no you know, just goes right in there and, and, and kind of sees it and names it and, and then lifts it up. It's, yeah, it's exactly. extraordinary. And the detail, like, I, I, you know, randomly, I just really love um, Straight Into Nothingness by being filled with forks and faces. Mm. There's something aggressive about forks and faces. Well, he takes you, you know. on a, such a dr brilliant, dramatic journey through that because he says, mm. 
what he's what he dramatizes and i suppose and in some ways it's the the controversial line about the drivel and the bitch what he dramatizes is um a hostile environment that's how it feels if you're turning up at a party and these people are all jabbering away about tuscany or house prices seem not just um boring but they they seem hostile they seem frightening mm -hmm. And then at the end of the poem, he brings you all the way around to his own, his own understanding of why he's going to the party. And you realise that they, like him, have had this whole thing and they've turned up and we're all just terrified. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's not lost on me that this is a, there is dialogue mm. within this. Yeah, you know, yeah. That, uh, along comes this playwright with a poem that's got dialogue yeah, in it. You know, yeah, it's, that's um, true. That's very true. And I think if... if you know, my practice with poetry ever since I was a kid, um, I would always read a poem and then, and then within a few lines, it either has you or it doesn't. I'm sure that's a pretty universal experience. But for me, I remember the line distinctly in a pig's ass friend. And I knew at once that this was the kind of person I could spend time with. I mean, what could be better? I say that all the time in a pig's ass friend. Do you? Because of him, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a great line. Isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Uh, it has the kind of bubbling dialogue of a party. Mm. It feels like that, I think. Um, and that's what he does so very cleverly. In screenwriting terms, he opens on the party. If I was doing this as a, as a drama, if it was, this was a film even, you open on the party, the terrible thing that he doesn't want to go to. Uh, and it has that absolutely that energy. But actually what you're looking at is the invitation or is it a phone call? Whatever it is, he gets you both at the same time, yeah. mm. which you can only do in a poem. You can only go, this is the invitation, and you get him alone, and you get the trees darkly swayed and the gas fire breathing, which are enough. They are the answer, the second bit of dialogue, that tell him, don't go, don't leave this house. And then immediately you're cut to, funny how hard it is to be alone. And he completely changes the, um, the atmosphere immediately. You know, and I love it when you find, and I think Larkin does this especially, like a line of poetry that is nothing like a poem, mm. that is like a, a statement that every human being would immediately recognise. Yeah. And I think that's amazing that he's yeah. able to, as a poet, that for me as a writer, that's incredible confidence. Yeah. And I would go so far as to suggest it's the kind of confidence you only get if you spend hours alone under a lamp. I think this, uh, in the fourth stanza, no one now believes the hermit with his gown and dish talking to God who's gone too. The big wish is to have people nice to you. And I kind of mm. think, God, that feels yeah. very modern Doesn't somehow. It, Doesn't it feels it? like Absolutely. right now. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, that, that is the big wish. Yes. Approval, yeah. affirmation. E even down to the which means doing it back somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You yeah. know, which is what that whole exactly. currency Virtue is on. social. Yeah. <laughs> social incredible. media is virtue. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you know, it's literally, there it is. Mm. It is that, and it's entirely that. And it's perhaps why now this poem is my best friend, because um, at the moment, this question of do you want to get in the, dive into the great pit of opinion, this terrible opinion pollution we're just awash with people's opinions um and it's created a kind of um uh you know the 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 new god is to have people nice to you which means doing it back somehow um and we're we are in terrible danger i mean enough that who care it doesn't matter really i don't want to sound like a lunatic but we are in terrible danger when we abandon any kind of um uh philosophy, moral philosophy, in favour of how it feels to be liked. Mm. And all of the greatest thinkers in humanity have not feared being disliked. It's their single defining characteristic. So to create a church of liking each other is an absolute sure way to total annihilation. So I just want to, I think I 
I think I'm not sure what, what happens here in this. Are then these routines playing at goodness, like going to church, something that bores us, something we don't do well? But try to feel, that's what I wanted to ask mm. about. What's that? Well, I think he's, he's saying, are these routines like church, something that bores us, something we don't do well, but try to feel? Oh, I see. So right. I think he's I saying, see. what. So I had a sort of a Church of England upbringing and the, the principle of, of that sort of Episcopalian uh, thing is that you're not supposed to be into it. It's cultural. I heard it once described as it's basically English Shintoism. It's just sort of vague worship of the monarch and some rituals that you kind of, you know, drift through. Mm. Um, but I remember being in church as a kid, sitting there and trying to sort of will myself to believe in God, feel mm. something. Mm. And everyone's singing, and I thought, feel something, feel something. I'm sure that's a pretty universal experience. Uh, trying to feel something in church and it's not feeling it. Brilliant, isn't it? To, mm. to kind of get to that. And, and again, with this just very simple language, you know, but yeah. try to feel. Because however crudely, it shows us what should, should be. be. Yeah. There's something about a, 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 an aspiration of what we feel we ought to be as mm. human beings. Well, and that's what he's so, I think, it's, it's how he thinks that makes him so special to me. Mm. Because what he's saying, I think, is these ideas, paradise, what is paradise? Most religious people, you don't, don't think about paradise at all because what is it going to be? If it's a garden, I mean, you know, God, is it really a garden? Or some kind of... Then you've got this whole celestial Il Devo concert of white dry ice and everyone's <laughs> singing, floating up towards some man. What? I mean, who wants to do that for all... For eternity? Not for, not for an hour and a half at Wembley. For all <laughs> time. Yea, unto the end of days. Well, no, who wants that? The trouble with paradise is it's antithetical to the human condition. Nobody's interested in heaven. And that's, what he's, that's what's so interesting. He plays with that idea. He asks you to consider it. it. You know, try to feel, because however crudely, it shows us what should be, however crudely. The idea that, as it says you know, in the Bible, the lion shall lie down with the lamb, the idea that we all connect perfectly and love each other as Jesus commanded us to do, and that we can love each other that simply and easily without... That's what we're supposed to do, and we all know we're supposed to but can't. But then what I love is he then rubbishes his own argument, too subtle that, too decent too. And it, it's true, you go, that, that's not it. That's not the problem. Yeah. Although it is also the problem. Right? Yeah. Oh hell, and that was a wonderful, mm. again, as Michael, as you said, that, that's another bit of dialogue, isn't it? Yeah. A bit of live. Thought. Yeah. And I love that the lamp comes back. Yeah. So simple. Yeah. So elegant in the best way. Yeah. And wonderful how it brings, and he, he puts this line perfectly, sitting by a lamp more often brings not peace, but other things. And he doesn't really, he, we know there are many of them, but he only names two, which are, God knows are two enough, failure and remorse. Um, but he expresses that so brilliantly, I think. Whispering. Yeah. Dear Warlock Williams. Why, of course. Yeah. Oh, fucking brilliant. But, okay, so for you then, do you think... So sitting by a lamp more often brings not peace, but other things beyond the light stand failure and remorse. So what, what are the, the failure and remorse? Those are, um, are some of the other things that, that uh, sitting under a lamp will bring. Right. You see, what he understands, and I think it's just so brilliant, is that what, if you're a writer, what, one of the things is that you... So what you say, especially if, you've, you know, if you're Virginia Woolf or whatever, you just say, what I need is a room of my own. So what you think is, I just need my space and my quiet, and then I can write. But of course it doesn't work like that. It doesn't ever work like that. The space and the quiet don't bring the words. And so you think, I'm going to sit under this lamp and write. And the moon is up there and the trees are darkly swayed and the gas fire breathes. It's always slightly worries because there's a slightly carbon monoxide oh, no, vibe to it. But anyway, let that go. Health and safety moment. Yeah. yeah. 
but he so but actually you what happens is you sit there and all you think about is failure and remorse and so you go to a party of course you do right put right. your coat on and get out right. as fast as possible right. because that chatter the chatter of the world is a way to distract ourselves from the ever-present knowledge of our own imminent and very soon demise and in a way, that's something to celebrate. I like that about it. I like the fact that that's an amazing thing about human beings, that we all know from quite early on that we're going to die yeah. alone, probably painfully. It, well, there's no way out but that. And yet, you know, we have parties. <laughs> people, th people know they're going to die and they still get up, go to Asda, buy the sausages and throw a barbecue. If that's not heroism, I don't know what is. <laughs> Ver de Societe. My wife and I have asked a crowd of craps to come and waste their time and ours. Perhaps you'd care to join us in a pig's ass, friend. The day comes to an end. The gas fire breathes. The trees are darkly swayed. And so... Dear Warlock Williams, I'm afraid. Funny how hard it is to be alone. I could spend half my evenings, if I wanted, holding a glass of washing sherry, canted over to catch the drivel of some bitch who's read nothing but which. Just think of all the spare time that has flown straight into nothingness by being filled with forks and faces rather than repaid under a lamp, hearing the noise of wind and looking out to see the moon thinned to an air-sharpened blade. A life, and yet how sternly it's instilled. All solitude is selfish. No one now believes the hermit with his gown and dish talking to God who's gone to. The big wish is to have people nice to you, which means doing it back somehow. Virtue is social. Are then these routines playing at goodness, like going to church, something that bores us, something we don't do well? asking that ass about his full research. But try to feel, because however crudely, it shows us what should be. Too subtle, that. Too decent, too. Oh, hell. Only the young can be alone freely. The time is shorter now for company. And sitting by a lamp more often brings not peace, but other things. Beyond the light stand failure and remorse, whispering, Dear Warlock Williams, why, of course. That was Michael with the gift reading of Ver de Societe by Philip Larkin. Our enormous thanks to Stephen Beresford for that phenomenal conversation. So eloquent, so insightful, so present and engaging. Yeah, just a real pleasure. And thanks to him for allowing us to share it with you. Thanks also to Faber and Faber for permission to share the poem. We've had a bit of Larkin come to us recently haven't we fee mm. and um of course this does remind me of more or less this time last year when we were in a field the far away field i think it was called the far away forest far away Something forest like far, far away, away forest. forest with our friends at latitude and we were due to be with them again this year so they've been on my mind and uh you know of course it's it's just really sad that we're not all able to be together in the faraway forest mm. uh, again. And I hope we will again 
this time next year. Nadine Shah brought us uh, the poem Days by Philip Larkin. So you can listen to that episode. It's in our archive. Uh, It's a special feature length edition with Nadine Shah and Hannah Jane Walker, who brought us that terrific Selena Godden poem, Pessimism is for Lightweights, which is a really great poem for the times that we're living in, I think. Yeah, it was incredible, wasn't it, Michael, that those two poems that came without any discussion with anybody had such a good intersecting connection. And just as you say that about Philip Larkin, because I know there's a couple of other people who've been to exchanges recently with with Philip Mm. Larkin poems. And given what Stephen was, was saying about why he is a friend, I think it is so great for us with this this exploration of poems as friends that it isn't you know it isn't always the comfortable places that's where you look for in a true friendship Mm. it's that honesty that you're after really and it's great to sort of see Larkin coming through the door so much there is just one more piece of news that I want to tell our listeners about, Fee. Very excitingly, Stephen Beresford has written a brand new one-man show for Andrew Scott, another Poetry Exchange alumni, and this is for the Old Vic. Now, the Old Vic don't receive any public funding, uh, and of course, uh, as with all theatres uh, at the moment, they're, they're struggling. So this is a way that you can help to support the Old Vic. You can buy tickets for this uh, special event. It's going to be happening on Wednesday the 29th of July through until Saturday the 1st of August with two shows on the Saturday. Um, So if you go to the Old Vic website, you'll be able to buy tickets there. That's for uh, Stephen Beresford's play Three Kings starring Andrew Scott. I can't wait. That's about all we've got time for this month. Just to remind you of our competition to win this limited edition print. Tell us your favourite Poetry Exchange episode and why mail us at hello at thepoetryexchange.co.uk. We'll be back with you next month with more poems as friends. Until then, thank you for listening. <laughs>